So, uh, good day, Mr. Izzy. We know that uh, the Czech Embassy is working in Ukraine, the Czech Republic, even in these difficult times since the February 24th, 2022. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your mission as diplomats here in Ukraine, about the support that the Czech Republic is uh, providing for our state? Well, first of all, it's important to say that Embassy personnel always should stay in the country as long as it's, as it's safe. So that's why we were one of the first embassies, I think we were actually the second, mm -hmm. to come back in April after the situation got better here in Kiev. Because our mission, our work is here. We are here to be, we are sent here by, by our st state to liaison with local authorities, to you know, work with, with your ministries, with your authorities, to, to now at this time to provide humanitarian aid, military aid, aid and so on, financial aid. So our mission is here, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say that we were, I think, the second embassy that reopened yes. after, after, after the situation got better in Kiev. Uh, yes, so the second question, what do you see the mission of the Czech diplomats, uh, like a personal mission and uh, the embassy uh, in supporting Ukraine during this war, like uh, the Czech parliament uh, today on November 16th, 2022, it has declared Russia as a terrorist regime. What is the mission of uh, the embassy and the Czech Republic to, to help Ukraine? Well, we generally actually follow main principles, main directions of our government with the help in, in help of Ukraine. So first of all, that's the political support. At the moment, we, we are the presiding country of the European Council. So we try to strive the Ukrainian question and the Ukrainian, you know, the, the war of Russia and Ukraine at all meetings of the European Union. Your ministers, your deputy ministers, they're all invited to Prague. That's something unprecedented. It didn't happen before, but now everyone, because of our pres presidency, is invited. We are the country that actually always puts the Ukraine question mm -hmm. on the high agenda in other international forums, and we support Ukraine politically, right? And also, as you say, we, we as part of this, uh, our, our parliament uh, declared Russia as a terrorist state yesterday, which is also a significant step, right? So that's political. Then we, of course, support, um, support Ukraine with their defense abilities. We're the first country to provide heavy weapons to Ukraine. If you look back at the beginning of, let's say, end of January, uh, end of February and beginning of March, you could see that there was strong hesitation among all EU and Western countries in general. Should we send weapons or not to Ukraine? That was the question. And everyone sent helmets or maybe some light weapons. But someone had to be the first. Someone had to break that informal embargo and send heavy mm. weapons. And who was that? That was the Czech Republic. We're proud of that. And then others followed. So we also provide Ukraine military help to defend itself, right? And thirdly, we of course provide also financial aid as, you know, as, as part of the EU and a huge humanitarian aid because we know that now winter is coming and it's important for, for, for people to have you know, a roof above their head and, and to have you know, something to heat up your, your dinner and so on. So we actually help Ukraine in these four dimensions. Uh, we value that very much and it is really unprecedented that a non-EU state to be present at almost all the EU meetings, parliamentary, not parliamentary, uh, on the highest level. Yep. Uh, we are very grateful to the Czech Republic for that, also for the humanitarian support and, of course, for the military support. Let's proceed into the okay, yeah, embassy. Let's go further. Okay, so Pan Iży, uh, when studying documents about uh, no November 17, 1989, the Valuate Revolution in Czechoslovakia, I have found uh, similarities, uh, quite astonishing ones, with Ukraine 2014, the Revolution of Dignity. Both uh, the protests started with uh, student meetings dispersed brutally by the governmental forces and then the next day uh, nationwide protests arose in Czechoslovakia and in Ukraine 2014. Uh, could you say what does it mean for the Czech people, the 1989, what happened there, uh, the Velvet Revolution? Well, 17, November 17th, 1989 is a turning point in our history. We say we came back to Europe where we belonged before. Uh, if you look at the Czechoslovak and Czech history, we had always been part of this, of this uh, uh, I would say, the West with big W, with a capital letter. And only for 40 years we were part of the Eastern, Eastern East with the capital E. And uh, after 40 years of communism and of the dominance of Soviet Union 
over you know, the satellites, including Czechoslovakia, our people clearly knew what they wanted. They wanted economic prosperity, they wanted freedom, they wanted democracy, all of the, you know, the, the market economy, all of these values, all of these signs of a normal state from, from our perspective. And uh, they, they saw the decadence, the decay in, in, in the society, moral decay and economic, economic unprosperity. So that's the reason why they wanted to be free, why they, didn't, they no longer wanted to be part of that Eastern Bloc, why they wanted to re-establish market economy and so on and so on. And you're right in saying that the, the students' protest, that was the beginning. Of course, people ha had been dissatisfied, uh, dissatisfied for, for many years, but there was this student protest, a pro protest on the 17th of November that actually uh, was at the beginning of, that, of, of the dissolution of the communist regime in, in Czechoslovakia. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the people of the 60s, the so-called people of the 60s, both in Czechoslovakia and in Ukraine. Uh, by that term we call the intelligence. Yes, uh, the people who uh, claim that democracy stands beyond everything and uh, the ones who were fighting, to say the least, uh, in the totalitarian regimes of the USSR and Czechoslovakia uh, for human rights. So can we say that uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, people of the 60s and the Ukrainian ones, uh, they had the same goal? Well, I think it's difficult to compare because the 60s, even in Czechoslovakia in mm. 1989, I, I would actually leave this to historians, but I actually think that the revolution in 1989 was driven mainly by, by the young people and not by the, the generation of the 60s. Uh, the generation of the 60s in Czechoslovakia was a bit different because they tried to, to uh, not to dismantle communist regime, but they wanted to reform that. And uh, it, the history shows that communism it cannot be reformed. It's a system that doesn't work, so it need to, needed to be dismantled. And that, that's what the generation in, uh, of 1989 or, already knew. So I wouldn't compare this, and I would leave the, the road of the six years mm -hmm. in 1989, and maybe later here to the historians. Okay, uh, and uh, people call the 1989 a developed revolution because it was almost bloodless, only some traumas were uh, inflicted to the protesters in the first days and uh, later on, after the uh, November 17th, 1989, the 1993, the Velvet Divorce. And uh, what happened, uh, what was the catalyst for the Slovak people and uh, for, for the Czech people to claim their in own independence and kind of divorce uh, from the common state of Czechoslovakia? You know, I'll say one thing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We, the Czechs, and then both, of course, also the Slovaks, we're so proud of that velvet dissolution of the state. We're so proud, especially considering the, the events that took place at the time, that were taking place for a couple of years in the Balkans, and parallel in the former Soviet Union. Uh, it's a unique moment in, in human history when two states separated, divided so easily, so peacefully. And uh, I think it's very, very, very symbolic, even, even as I said now, in Ukraine and in all post in, in countries of former Soviet Union, because we can look at the, at the South Caucasus or Central Asia and all of these problems. Uh, we're now sitting at the embassy. It's a former Czechoslovak general consulate. And we share it with the Slovaks. And we share the same heating system. And we don't cheat, and uh, we share the same garage, and that's a unique partnership. When we elect a new president, or when there's a new government established in Prague, in the Czech Republic, the first foreign trip is always to Bratislava, and the other way around, the vice versa. The Slovak prime, uh, prime minister or president always goes to Prague for the first foreign visit. So this relationship is, is unique, and uh, of course at the time, in 1993, it was not so, uh, it was totally peaceful, but there were high, ten high tensions, of course, and we had to divide the federal property, and there were many unclear questions, but it was done peacefully, and, and uh, no one has ever threatened the other side with weapons mm -hmm. or with anything like this, or with any territory claims. So it was really, really, really peaceful, and we are very, very proud of that. Okay, uh, so the follow-up question, what made uh, the Czech and Slovak people unite into one federal state in the first place in 1918? after the First World War? 
Right. For, for, to answer this question, we need to look at the history and at the situation at the end of the First World War, where new countries were established. And countries, some of them actually had not existed before. And at that time, uh, when our Czech, I would say Czech, uh, uh, Czech politicians fought for establishing, re-establishing of the Czech state, or Bohemian state, uh, they were also part of, they were also Slovak. Slovak uh, uh, politicians, they wanted to establish the state. And as part of the negotiation process with the, with the, with the, with, with the United States, uh, the Great Britain, France and other, other countries, it was established that these countries will actually work together, uh, be, be together. Mm -hmm. Because actually, if you look at history, Slovak state did not exist before. Czech state or Bohemian state had existed, but Three, 350, years, uh, 350 years ago. So it was part of the, kind of, uh, the result of the process where to, how to form the territory in Central Europe and which countries should belong where. And of course, we can forget the fact that we, uh, although we had not been in one state before mm -hmm. 1918, but uh, we, language-wise, were very similar, culture-wise also. Okay, uh, so I believe that it was uh, uh, an alliance of two very close people to survive, to survive the uh, difficult times of the 1920s. Yep, and then, absolutely. Okay, and uh, remembering the Yugoslavia, the other uh, Soviet bloc uh, country, federal country, Slavic country, and remembering the bloody wars between different parts of that uh, Yugoslav country, the words Srebrenica and Sarajevo are synonyms of hell to earth uh, to many people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Croatia and in Serbia, other countries of the region. How did it happen that uh, a country divided so peacefully, the Czech and the Slovakians? So you, you said you had uh, some federal property, some common, common property. How did it, maybe it's something with the mentality of the people or something else? Well, first of all, uh, the division of the property was very easy because we have the population of roughly 10 million people and the Slovaks have 5 million. Mm -hmm. So all federal properties was divided to one. So if you had 15 locomotives, we got 10, Slovaks got 5. If we had three tanks, we got two, they got one. It was very easy, there was no questions about that. And there were committees established at each city where the federal property was located. And they, mm -hmm. they consisted of Slovaks and Czechs, and they just decided. There was no, no dispute on this. The border was more or less the same. After the, 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 uh, the after 1993, yeah. later on, we just, you know, looked at the border and some, there were some discrepancies, like the border moved a couple of hundred meters to the right or to the left, but basically the border was established. And uh, uh, to answer a question, I think it's got much to do with the Czech and Slovak mentality. It may, it may, be sound, it may actually sound funny, but you know the Czechs, uh, we're, the, we're the nation of, of, um, of the, the soldier Schweik, and uh, yeah. always when we have a problem, we just go for a beer, and things are solved. It's, you know, I don't want to uh, kind of make fun of that, but it's true, we're not the nation that would take uh, knives and weapons, and uh, we just go for a beer, we go for a beer with Slovaks, and uh, we solve the issues, but peacefully. I mean, no tensions. Okay, uh, so maybe you have some advice for the Ukrainian people, for the Ukrainian uh, nationalities, because Ukraine is a multinational country. Uh, on the advice of the Czechoslovakia, how we solve our conflicts peacefully inside different mentalities. It is the aggressor state, which is, ha has been declared by the Czech parliament as the terrorist regime. Uh, it has always been the problem and the only country we had some knives out moments. So uh, maybe you have some advices on how to solve the issue with uh, the northern neighbor peacefully after the war, of course, after the Ukrainian victory and uh, the national sovereignty of Ukraine is being uh, reforged again. Well, first of all, I need to say that I'm fully convinced that Ukraine will, will win this war. Uh, Ukraine is right. Ukraine is a victim. And we do everything we can as the country to help Ukraine. And as the EU, as the NATO, as NATO, as, uh, as the international community. So I'm totally convinced that Ukraine will win. 
And afterwards, of course, it will be difficult to, to, to establish and set up relations with, uh, with, your, with, your, with, your, with your neighbor, with the aggressor state. But uh, it's, the, it's the way it is. Russia will always stay on your territory, uh, on your territory, sorry, on your, on your borders. Mm -hmm. And we had a similar case in 1945 when we also had to deal with, with the aggressor state. And uh, of course, the history went in its way. And uh, it was possible also. So I'm sure that uh, even after the victorious war, the relations will be kind of established. It will be a very tough process, very difficult process for both sides. And, uh, but uh, that's the way it is. You always need to deal with, with your neighbors. But I'm sure that Ukraine will be successful in this. Okay. Uh, I'd like to note that to make that kind of uh, peaceful negotiation, you have to have uh, the ability and uh, the will, the wish of both sides. Absolutely. It is Absolutely. not possible uh, until the other side is willing to be open to real negotiations. And if you go into negotiations, you cannot set up, set up preconditions just mm -hmm. before you actually go into negotiations, of course. Yes. And maybe the final question will be more personal. How do you feel working right now in Kyiv uh, on November 15th, 2022? Uh, just the day before we are filming this interview, we had massive strikes all over Ukraine. Almost 100 cruise missiles and uh, kamikaze drones were launched at Ukrainian uh, cities, infrastructure. And how do you feel working in these conditions in Kyiv right now? You know, if the society here didn't get along with this situation here, if there were people running in the streets and if, if there were panic, it would be difficult to live here. But when looking at people here, how they, how they organize, how they actually accept this, the mm -hmm. situation, because they are united, they're united as a nation and they know they're about to win, then it's really much easier to be here, to work here under these conditions, as you say, when the rockets are flying. Because when you see in, uh, on the streets that and when you talk to the people, that they even say, OK, we don't have electricity for a couple of hours a day, but we will win anyway. It makes people even stronger and that makes you as a foreigner here also strong. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this comprehensive interview, very important for us at the Ukrainian state and I believe at the Czech Republic side too. I am very grateful to you, Mr. Pablo, thank Asian. you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.